Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Castellino, the new visual arts manager here with Workman Arts. As a white Italian Canadian settler, it is a privilege to work within the colonial borders of so-called Canada. Workman Arts is located in Turkoronto within the Treaty, uh, Treaty 13 territory, which is the rightful land of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. I am hopeful our futures include liberation from all forms of settler colonization with land back from Turtle Island to Palestine. It is my pleasure to work with our guest curator, Sarah Ty Black, on their exhibition, Wherever You Are is Where I Want to Be, as part of our 2023 Rendezvous with Madness Festival. Thank you to Sarah Ty and to all the artists in this exhibition for generously sharing your work with us and for giving us further insight tonight. This exhibition is indebted to the words and the thinking of disability justice educator, Mia Mingus, Wherever you are is where I want to be, offers access intimacy as the unstructuring logic for our queer and trans crip futures. Refusing the loudly eugenicist mapping of isolation and disposability upon our disabled queer trans crip body minds, the multidisciplinary practice platformed here speaks to a loved urgency in the ways in which embodied experiences of access intimacy have the capacity to reconfigure time, space, and relation. Spanning insulation to textile to video, the work of these artists proposes the act, experience, and feeling of crip kinship as a meaning and model of radical future making. We would like to thank our funders and supporters, first to our government funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, Department of Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, Telefilm Canada and the City of Toronto through this Toronto Arts Council. Thanks to our partner, Cam H, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Thank you to our sponsors, Artscape, Mini Giants Printing, and Onboard Digital. Thank you to our board of directors, our donors and supporters, as well as the Workman Arts and Rendezvous team for making this event possible. Thanks again to the talented Sarah Ty Black for creating this impactful exhibition and to the artists for their vulnerability in sharing their work. Jay is our active listener today. Please feel free to reach out to them if you need to talk about any difficult or triggering content throughout this talk. So thanks everybody for joining us. I just wanted to go through the bios of the artists that we're going to be hearing from today. Uh, let's start off with Sarah Tai, our guest curator. So Sarah Tai Black is an arts curator, film programmer, and critic, born, most, born and mostly raised in Treaty 13 territory, or Toronto, whose work aims to center Black, queer, trans, and crip freedom practices with an emphasis on working relations which interrogate and dismantle white supremacy culture. Their curatorial work has been staged on Platform Center for Photographic and Digital Arts, Windex Festival of Moving Image, Cambridge Art Galleries, Dunlop Art Gallery, MOCA, Paved Arts, and A Space Gallery. And they have worked in public art spaces such as Art Museum at the University of Toronto, McMaster Museum of Art, and as the Interim Artistic Director of Paved Arts. From 2022 to 2023, they were selected participant in the McMaster Museum of Arts Curatorial Mentorship Program, working under the guidance of curator Pamela Edmonds with the support from Canadian Heritage. And in 2021, they were a curatorial fellow at the Flattery Film Seminar, Flaherty Film Seminar. <laughs> and then, Speaking to our artists, the first artist I would like to introduce is M. Patchwork Monoceros, and this is their biography. <laughs> They're waving there. <laughs> M. Patchwork Monoceros is a poet and interdisciplinary artist exploring polysensory production and somatic grief through text, fiber, and film. Their work considers a collective crip, which is queer and crip, consciously connecting uh, connecting to marvelous bodies living with complexity as sick or disabled. A Black creator of Jamaican heritage, 
M was amongst the winners of the 2023 Grant for Disabled Artists from Arts Accessibility Network Manitoba. In 2022, Moniceros received the Arts Leader Award and in 2021, the Emerging Excellence Prize, both from the Manitoba Arts Council. Moniceros' writing and artwork have been presented across Turtle Island and internationally. M Patchwork, aka Patch, is based in Treaty One Territory or Winnipeg, Manitoba, home to the Métis Nation and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Dene, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. Their first collection of poetry, Remedies for Chiron, is being published with Radiant Press and was released in spring of 2023. So that's Patch. Next up is Chelsea. So Chelsea Campbell is a queer crip artist, educator, and cultural worker. A non-binary white settler of Scottish descent, Campbell graciously resides as an uninvited guest in so-called Edmonton on Treaty, Treaty 6 territory. Exploring tender narratives of disability justice, feminized care, labor, and crip kinship, their practice intertwines <clears throat> Sorry, their practice intertwines auto ethnographic storytelling with community oriented practices of access, care, and interdependence. Through a combination of printmaking, 3D modeling, and insulation and photography, their work seem, seeks to make space for the body in pain, celebrate disabled narratives as complex and whole, and bring radical access for community through artistic practice. And then we have Harmeet. So this is Harmeet's bio. Harmeet is a fat, trans, disabled, Sikh, Punjabi, multidisciplinary artist, educator, and organizer based in Toronto. Harmeet primarily does illustration, collage, painting, and textile arts and facilitates community arts programming on these mediums. They are currently an MA student in the Critical Disability Studies Program at York University where their research further explores the themes of their arts practice, pandemic care networks, intergenerational crip archives, hacking normative design, Punjabi, survivorhood, and fat temporality. And then next up we have Alex. So Alex Dolores Salerno, um, born in 1994 on the homeland of the I did not practice these, I'm so sorry. Uh, on the homeland of many indigenous nations, um, also known as Washington, DC. An interdisciplinary artist from Leka Ponet, Lene Pe Hokin, also known as New Brooklyn, New York. Salerno received an MFA from Parsons School of Design and their BS from Skidmore College. They have exhibited at the Museum for Modern Kunst in Frankfurt, a Paseo de Art Contemporano de Castellan in Castellan, and Argo Center for Audiovisual Arts in Brussels, Art Windsor Exit, Essex, the Shelley and Ronald Rubin Foundation's Eight Floor Gallery, the Ford Foundation Gallery, among others. Salerno is a recipient of the 2022 Win Newhouse Awards, and their work has been featured in the New York Times and Art in America. They have been an artist in residence at the Art Beyond, Art Beyond Sites Art and Disability Residency from 2019 to 2020, the Artist Studios Program at the Museum of Arts and Design, the Artist Visual Artist Airspace Residency at Avon's Art Center, and they are currently in residence at Bree Brick Lab Art Contemporary. And last but not least, we have Logan McDonald. So Logan is an artist, curator, writer, educator, and activist who focuses on identity and belonging through queer, disability, and decolonial perspectives. He is of mixed European and Mi'kmaq ancestry, Mi'kmaq ancestry, and identifies with both his indigenous and settler roots. Born in Summerside, Prince Edward Island, his Mi'kmaq ancestry is connected to 
Alma Sukatwek. Kita Kam Cook, his artwork. Oh, Elm. <laughs> Elma. Do you want to pronounce it? Sure. It's a Thank you. A Mesdaquick Damaguk, spelled K T A Q. Sorry, M K U K. I'll also drop it in the chat. Also known say, as Newfoundland. Yeah. Also known as Newfoundland. Another website that you can listen to. His artwork has exhibited across North America, notably with exhibitions at LACE, John Connolly Presents, Ace Art Inc., The Rooms, and Baca. His, art, his work has been published by Goose Lane, Canadian Art, C Magazine, Unprojects, and more. In 2019, McDonald was long listed for the Sobe Art Awards and was honored with a six months residency at the Kunsten or House Betening in Berlin. He holds a BFA in Interdisciplinary Studies from Concordia University and an MFA in Studio Arts from York University. In 2019, he was the lead accessibility consultant for the Toronto Waterfront Sidewalk Labs project. In 2021, he was a keynote speaker for the Canadian Public Arts Funders. And in 2022, he was a respondent for the Arts Council for the Ontario Arts Council, sorry, strategic plan. Currently, McDonald is a Canada Research Chair and an Assistant Professor in Studio Arts at the University of Waterloo. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, and we'll be turning it over to the artists to give their own little visual descriptors, um, but that's it for me. I'm Rebecca, the Visual Arts Manager with curly, dark hair, glasses, and I'm I'm wearing a red top, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Sarah Tai. Hello, I'm Sarah Tai. My pronouns are they, them. I am a fat, light-skinned, mixed-race Black person. I'm currently reclining on my bed because I have no energy and my brain feels like mud. So if I'm talking slowly and cognitively processing slowly, missing things, that's what's happening with me. Um, I'm wearing a reddish-pink baby tee um, and I have the same color lipstick and the same color glasses and the same color hair because I'm twisted I'm twisted um, and behind me you can see books that I don't have the capacity to read but give off an air that I might um, and I want to thank you all for being here with us tonight um, before I pass it over to our beautiful wonderful amazing artists who I feel so privileged to have been able to engage with their work um, in this curatorial capacity. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, the reality of the world right now. We're not living in a nice little disability bubble. Um, many of us have ties to folks in Gaza, got ties to um, Muslim and Arab communities that are being targeted, ties to present or ancestral lands that have um, endured the same patterns we're seeing repeating today. Um, and of course, the multiply state-sanctioned violence and eugenics that is happening to expel Palestinians from their land, to dispossess them from their ancestral land, um, intersect with many issues, but especially intersect with disability justice. Um, I think it goes without saying for all of us that imperialism is always ableist. So. I just wanted to hold a little space for that if folks are feeling some type of way right now. Um, and that's totally okay to feel that way. And one little quick note, if you're in Toronto, right after this, there is a uh, vigil um, for those who have been essentially murdered um, by the Israeli military in the last two weeks. It's at Queen's Park at seven. So if you have the spoons, if you have the ability to show up in that way, um, very much feel free to take part in that and uh, share space for mourning and community. And with that, I will just quickly pass it over to our artist. Whoever got, wants to go first, please do. And just a quick introduction, a quick visual description. Maybe if you want to check in or if you don't want to, 
you don't have to share. <laughs> so I will choose randomly Logan because he looks like a sitting duck ripe for the picking. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Sarah Ty. And thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Um, I'm Logan McDonald. I am a white coated, as as told in my um introduction of mixed European, also Mi'kmaq ancestry, but I'm white coated, um cis male. Um, you're looking at my head floating in the middle of this of my little video screen box, and I am wearing a it looks like a black sweater, but it's actually navy. And I've got thinning black hair. It used to be a lot blacker when I was younger, but it's thinning and going gray because I'm aging. Um, what else? And I'm, I think I have a kind face, but just recently I was told by a colleague, I'm a professor and I have lots of students. And I was actually, this is part of my check-in. I was part of a, um, I teach at the University of Waterloo, where the there was a violent incident that happened over the summer that some of you may have heard of, where an attacker um, entered into a gender studies classroom and uh, trigger warning um, violently attacked the professor. And our university has decided to, as a response to that, um, create a series of panels that are meant to create conversation and let people literally check in about what's been happening. And I was part of the first one, which was yesterday, and it was called Antagonism in the Academy. Um, and to prepare for that was quite agonizing because I, yeah, it's just a hard thing to think about and a hard thing to think about what we do and how we're not passive and but anyway um switching gears i don't want to spend too much time on that because it was already very draining um important but draining um one of the exercises that i had purchased that i sort of created for myself was to ask my students how they've dealt with antagonism um but also to ask colleagues and uh and explain kind of my approach to what I was going to talk about. And my one colleague said, you know, you have a reputation for being really tough. And I was absolutely shocked. They were like, you're not mean, but all of your students think that you're really, really challenging. You ask really difficult questions. You're like, yeah, you hold them to task. And I was like, I was under the misguided impression that I was the kindest, most warmest, approachable professor. And I was like, look at this kind face. I'm not mean. So all that to say, I have a kind face. Um, so a little bit about what I presented um, in this exhibition. Uh, it's a work that I've um shown a couple times usually it's a different iteration each time but it's sculptural um and i essentially as an artist typically bring materials together that i can create a conversation with a sort of visual vocabulary and this work arose out of thinking about my disability as a someone with degenerative hearing loss and it's hereditary it comes from the same lineage that my Mi'kmaq ancestry comes from, in fact. And so me, my mother, her father, and it goes on. And I was thinking about cultural legacies and how they're disrupted um, already, but then to have this extra layer of, of a communication barrier or an ability to access information or, you know, and so I was thinking about the other ways in which we communicate, thinking really about our bodies and about other um, experiences that we hold together to exchange knowledge. And at the same time that I was working on this particular work, um, it was when there was a lot of, um, it was when Eustotin, uh, 
get sane camp um was having a lot of corporate and rcmp um oh my god like they were literally experiencing the pipeline being you know and, and protests was happening all across canada it was at the end of the beginning of 2020 um and so i was and it and it which led to lots of really amazing conversations and mobilization activism to like really show solidarity with the Stoughton camp um which i've had the opportunity to visit and and participate as a laborer so i have i have my own you know hopes and and aspirations for them to have sovereignty over their land and agency um but at the time i was not in canada i was in berlin so i was kind of watching remotely as all this was unfolding and i and then you know just leading to a lot of the public activism around taking down monuments and so i was really thinking about um these statues and what they symbolize and as an artist thinking about their materiality and being a real signifier of colonization but also thinking about them as materials that have come from the earth and so I was thinking how do we decolonize those materials and how do we decolonize ourselves in terms of the things that are ingrained in us um, socially and so what I showed in this exhibition is a kind of clustering of colonial signifiers, like big hands made out of bronze that are essentially integrated with plant life, like tobacco um, plants growing kind of around. Um, and then antlers um, sort of wedged in between to support the growing of the tobacco. Um, so there are these kind of, there's three little small sculptural pieces and each one of them is a tobacco plant a bronze hand and a antler like a moose antler and the reason the moose antler is included is because I mean typically I think folks would look at a moose antler and think that's your indigenous signifier which I feel like yes but it's actually the reason I incorporated it is because through my research and I was thinking, I, I like to work with metaphors and I was interested in thinking about other animals that have different, um, where hearing plays in a significant part in their survival. And I had read somewhere that moose, it's believed that moose grow their antlers seasonally to help them um, beware of predators, but also to help find mates. And I thought that was really interesting, that kind of like that duality of pain and pleasure, which I also think kind of taps into notions of being queer and being gay and surviving certain types of environments while trying to find partners. Um, and also last thing, tobacco, I had read also, um, I'm not sure if it's tobacco or persimmon, but one of them has, it, it, there is something about vibrations, like it, tobacco sends out signals that attracts um, uh, pollinators. And I was like, oh, that's another way in which vibration, thinking about sonic hearing, thinking about attraction. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Logan, in your notably kind face and demeanor. Um, I just wanted to quickly check in at, since it's 6.30. I know we haven't even started questions yet, but um, just if anyone needs like a quick break, feel free to do so. I think I'm going to turn my camera off for like a minute. Um, but yeah, is there anyone who does not need a quick break who would like to do their visual description and short intro? Everyone? I can do that while people do breaks. No pressure. I don't want to deprive <laughs> you of a bio break i <laughs> know you're good i don't need to shit right now <laughs> if there's one thing i care about besides seating it's a bio break uh, okay. thank you hermit yeah no worries um hermit speaking uh pronouns are they them um i'm a light-skinned brown person who is mid-fat i'm wearing like a black and gray checkered cardigan and a white top with thin black frames and i have short black hair with a bit of a fade and my background is like my house but it's like very gray um and there's kind of like a hot pink painting that's like 
peeking out. Um, and that's about it. Oh, and I'm wearing gold bear earrings because I wanted to be cute. <laughs> um, and what else are we supposed to talk about? Um, you could just give a short intro to your practice if you would like. And okay. if you don't, we can just keep going around the circle it's up to you okay cool yeah I could do a quick um intro um I come from like a multiply disabled family that's intergenerationally disabled and there's like really complex histories around like substance use and madness um and displacement and genocide and lots of complicated things and so that kind of shows up in my work I think my attempt is to always like archive what it means to grow up around disability so, so intensely without the language of it. Um, and so yeah, lots of like archival things, but I do a lot of illustration and collage and painting and textile work. My mom was a seamstress um, and like my family's full of like carpenters and painters. And so I think that shows up in the types of mediums I find myself gravitating towards. And I think as of right now, I've been thinking a lot about um, I don't know, like Punjabi architecture, like the way that Punjabi architecture and design is already very crip and like very queer um, and the ways that it kind of gives us space to be very differently than I think like Western architecture. I come from like an accessibility coordination and web access background along with like the billion other things I'm sure we all are doing and I'm doing. Um, so I'm always like interested about the things that aren't working. Um, so that's kind of, I'm gonna leave it at that. <laughs> leave it at that. I love Chelsea. Oh, thank you. Hi, hello. Um, I just want to start by saying what a privilege it is to share space with you all. And even the humans I can't see right now on camera, uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, so as a brief visual description, I'm a fat white non-binary femme. I have long brown hair that's kind of half pulled up into a uh, lazy high ponytail. Uh, I have some oversized uh, hexagonal shaped glasses um, and I have a big smile on my face. Although I also teach at universities and I have also recently been informed that I am a hard ass and I don't agree. Look at this delightful face. I'm very upset by it. Um, so I'm coming to you today from my home in Amispachi, West Kaigen. Um, You can see I'm surrounded by plants trying to pretend like winter hasn't already arrived here. Uh, and I have one of my old lithographs in the background to keep me company with my green plant that he's in background. Um, oh yeah, and I'm wearing my finest fashion clown top. It's like half dark green, half black, alternating on the sleeves. Um, and my practice is really focused on looking at how uh, Crip storytelling is the way that we share um, our survival mechanisms. And in particular, when we're talking through states of disaster like the recent pandemic. Um, and I'm really interested in illuminating and amplifying those survival strategies to find radical new futures where it's not enough for a crypt community to survive, but finding ways for us to radically thrive through sharing our stories. Um, so again, just delighted and privileged to be in space with you all. Thank you, Chelsea. I think next we'll go to Alex. Hi, um, I'm Alex Dolores Salerno. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am a white Latinx person, Ecuadorian and Italian American. And I um, have short beard stubble. I have a dark brown mullet about shoulder length. I'm wearing a, a dark green sweater. Um, and I am coming to you from my bed um, at um, which, um, I thought to do um, at the suggestion of Sarah Ty, so I'm really grateful for that. I was just gonna like sit up at like a desk, and I was like, then I realized that um, we're all um, working and living on crypt time. So I'm like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna come from bed. Um, <laughs> so behind me is just the white wall of my bedroom, um, and there are a couple things on it that. Can't, can't really really see because they're getting cut off but I, I did want to show them um because I thought about where I would sit um behind me is like I put my massage tools on the wall um so that I remember that they're there and I use them um and then above me is 
um, a poster by Jen White Johnson, and it says, it says, Artista Valiente, Dando Luz, Dando Alegria, Dando Amor, which means autistic, brave, giving light, giving joy, giving love. Um, and in my hand, I have a STEM toy. It is a orange and um, green interlocking, um, interlocking chain, I guess. And it makes a clicking noise. And yeah, this, I always love to show my STEM toys whenever I do a Zoom talk, because they're usually like off screen in my hands, but I'm constantly going like this. And if we were in person, it would be visible. And I also want to make them visible. Um, so yes, STEM toy. Um, yay. Uh, what else? Um, I'm so grateful to be with everybody today and to be part of this show. And this show has brought me so many like really warm feelings. And I just wanted to mention that the photos, seeing the photos from the opening made me so happy because everybody was masked. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like I need more of this. Um, it's been sad for me seeing um that just disappear. Um I'm 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 in Brooklyn, New York. Um in Lenape hooking. Um, and I feel like that's just rare to non-existent at this point, unless we're in a like small bubble of disabled artists. Um, so it um brought me a lot of joy to to see that and also like um see it just be such a like an easy natural thing that we're doing. Um and yeah, so my practice, um I work with a lot of a variety of materials. I consider myself interdisciplinary, but mostly a conceptual sculptor. I um, work from a queer crit perspective to critique um, standards of productivity, um, commodification of rest, and um, kind of the, basically the tensions between um, the demands for, for work that, um, don't align with our body minds and um yeah I guess at the core of everything is is needs um and recognizing needs making space to, to talk about them and acknowledge them and honor our needs and I guess maybe it sounds simple just like making work about needs but I often feel like it's not talked about enough especially in workplaces I'm really interested in how our body minds do or don't align with our workspaces because I feel like as a disabled person, I'm like forced to confront my capacity for work every day. Um, and for the show, I showed a work called Pillow Fight, um, which is um, a growing number of pillowcases right now, 10 um, or 11, including the touch pillow um, that are filled with used medical supplies from myself and friends and family and community. Um, and they're huddled together in a corner. Um, so you don't see what's inside, you know what's inside of them, but you don't see what's inside of them. Instead, you can see the weight and you can see them supporting each other. Um, and it's like a collective portrait. It um, It's also, I also wanted to, to thank Sarah Tai for, for collaborating with me in, in the installation before when I, I've shown this work uh, um, a lot of times in the past in, in different amounts of pillows. Um, and I've always shown it, uh, I've always installed it myself um, or with someone to help me, but I, I would I would take a lot of time to um, kind of make the composition as like an extension of, of the studio. Um, and so this was the first time that um, I just kind of gave the materials and um, let the those creative decisions um, um be someone else's decisions and I it just was so wonderful for me to um especially with this work because it's like such a collective work to have have that that work become come to life like in 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 a way in oh in this in this new way and like being able to to collaborate in a new way for me was really 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 special so thank you And last but certainly not least, note, please, Patch, that I am not grabbing my Wesley Snipes book and your book, holding them up to the screen to compare your author photos, which are strikingly similar. I'm not doing that. 
on to Patch. Thanks for that. That that small grace there. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Patch Manaceros. I am a black agender, a uh, mid fat person with a fuzzy bucket hat in like a pumpkin orange. Um, I have dark green rounded square glasses and like various bits of jewelry pierced into holes of my face. Um, I'm wearing a black, what are these called? Turtleneck um, and equally fuzzy uh, overalls with kind of like canvas white um, straps that are visible. Behind me is my, well, what's it called? I can't remember the name of this paint, but it's like a maroon burgundy sort of color. And then my quilt um, called something I can't remember right now because brains uh, is behind me and it's handmade and uh, I, I did it by hand and took a year. Um, and that's something I do sometimes is take a really long time to make art. So I'm going to talk about that. I have pieces in the show <laughs> that are quilts and I piece a piece in the show that is a video a film. Um, and I um, wanted to kind of make something to have a conversation with like being stuck at home for all the reasons that I've been stuck at home, it's like pre pandemic and especially in the pandemic. Um, and it's been really hard to not have masks in places that it would be great if they were masks. Um, it's been hard to see, um, like ch choices that could be safer and they're just not, um, by folks that say that they love us and folks that say that they're fighting for our lives. And, um, there's a lot of like, I just, well, I've just been cooped up for so long. So I, I mean, I have to go to XYZ. So I've also been in my home, I, but I don't, I don't think of it as being stuck. Um, and folks that really need to like, you know, endanger the world by doing travel things maybe to, because like they need vacation or they need a different change of, um, uh, of scenery. We all need vacation. We all need like rich things um, in our atmospheres, but we also like all need our immune systems to like protect us. Um, and so as someone who can't kind of just uh, do any kind of really travel outside of my home too much, um, I haven't had, I've had, I've missed a lot of experiences that other people include people have been able to have. Sometimes seeing family, um, seeing different places, um, feeling the vibe of you know other environments um and so in this piece uh in praise of voice notes in penguin pebbling i have four quilts in a video like i mentioned um and uh the quilts are photographs of different places around my home that i look at a lot because i'm home all the time so um it's part of a series i'm, I'm making called uh, morning microcosmites and it's thinking about the ways that I move around my home and like literally around this, you know, circumstances of, circumstance of my home. Um, that's my commute as well, you know? And so it's like, I work from home. I have phone appointments. I have, um, you know, medical stuff that happens at home. I have whatever. So um, just kind of honoring the fact that we can still have like pretty like intricate, like um, dynamic social lives if even if we can't go past our own doors um and so yeah there there's a place where I always I have birds in the background in my backyard that hang out and so the little window and I sit there and I watch them and then I get like really flustered and I send voice notes to people because I'm like there's 14 ravens this morning um and so if you love me and uh know about my bird thing you've gotten a message about that so um different places that I look at different places that um I cross through so doorways and things like that um and yeah I just want to kind of invite us to like honor the places where we're at as like scenery as like like amazing you know Coraline style like extravagant um places regardless of what they're actually made out of or regardless of where they actually are um and by doing I did want to share this tonight that by doing the so by spending so much time with some of the photos in the video I'm like thinking about them differently even though like I use my lift all the time but now I'm like huh 
this is this different experience, kind of neat. Um, and I'm looking, looking at my windows a different way and um, it feels really meaningful to share these little bits with people. So thank you for, thank you, Sarah Ty, for including me and thank you everyone for making it happen. And that or, that opening was beautiful. Oh, sorry, Sim Toy is my phantom um, Rubik's Cube that is uh, cold in black. And then when it heats up, it warm puts into all the colors. And so, Me and Logan are like, huh. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I do want to acknowledge that it's 648 and I have not asked a single question. Um, I don't feel any type of way about that other than perhaps I have infiltrated the chat with the slow energy that has been haunting me all week. Um, I think also we might go over time and feel free to message me if you are feeling like you need a break if you're feeling like I'm done um and also if you don't have the spoons or energy to be on screen and advocate for yourself in that way like message it's all good it's all good um I think that yeah Alex and Patch your comments about the opening um that was just a really special space and time for me I think that in the past, when I have had the privilege of curating shows like this that center on specifically visibility justice and the witness work that goes into um, the community building and kinship that we have and experience, um, it's been in terms of an optimistic hope towards a more liberatory present and future. And this show is very much still that, but it's deeply grounded in the grief of the pandemic of the last several years of grieving friendships that I've lost for folks who could not care about us enough to show up for us in the ways that we needed, um, increased isolation and disposability that I have been feeling, especially now that COVID has kind of been pushed under the rug, even though it's still affecting us. Um, and also kind of complicating that is the fact that um, I would only be able to have the spoons to help build a space like this it, under the impetus of labor. So it's kind of like a, it's like a little treat, <laughs> but also like the reality is like, if I didn't have to pay rent, what would I be doing and how would I be able to find these spaces? Um, but yeah, I wanted to kind of center that grief work that I've been doing, especially this year, and expand that feeling into a show, um, kind of beyond language, but it, that exact feeling in space in the relations between the works, um, whether it's virtually or in person or however you're interacting. Um, and also remind myself that a lot of those feelings were still possible and present. So the opening was really special. I remember looking at Harmeet and I was like, Harmeet has all of these friends that are on the same page. How is that possible? I have like one and this patch and they're in the show. <laughs> so it was a really um, special event. And I'm so beyond happy and joyful. And I've almost said pleasured, but like, you know what I mean? Like, it is a pleasurable experience <laughs> um, that you've all taken part um, in this kind of crypt present affirming space. Um, but yeah, I think that maybe if we could start off at the time of 6.52, um, if you could speak a bit to um, the kind of viewer relations and dynamics that you're cultivating in your work that speak to this. We have a, a lot of touch objects in this show, but we also have different ways of communicating, different ways of understanding, different ways of being in space. So yeah, and please feel free if you're like me and you kind of like to have mic off so you can just jump in, but also if you're like, no, I like the boundary, that's fine too. Yes. Um, if you could share a bit of kind of like your intentions and wishes for your work in terms of your relations and that kind of dynamic. I'm happy to jump in to get things started. Um, so in terms of viewer relationship, I've been really exploring this idea of access as materiality. And I see that 
across uh, unfolding multiple forms in the way that I work, in the way that I hold space for community, and then also in the way that we look at uh, actually displaying that work and disrupting art standards to become uh, crypt. So I have asked uh, whenever I display my work to reduce the hang height down to from the standard of a 56 or 58 inch midline down to a 50 or a 52. So that regardless of our body minds, everybody hopefully can feel seen in their body in that space. And then um, in a shout out to the amazing access work of Bajana Kukliak and Finnegan Shannon, uh, uh, all my work is always accomplished with uh, or accompanied with this idea of an alt text as poetry translation. So writing a poetic response to my work that hopefully captures the, um, again, the grief, the deep grief that kind of happens in the space of the work, but also the joy uh, and trying to find ways that we can express that beyond the lens of just a visual arts practice uh, to becoming more multimodal, uh, to find ways for new body minds to feel seen and heard in my work. And I hope they feel that way when they see it. Um, I can go next. Um, I think I was in high school when I went and visited my mom at work. And she's she used to be um, a cleaner at the airport for a really long time. And I remember she took me to this part of the airport where it was like public art in the airport at Pearson. But behind it was this like ledge, but it was hidden by the public art. And she was like, that's where I sleep, like during my shift. Right. So like, that's where I take a break. And I think it was this like very intense moment of being like that, like labor is fucked. Racism is fucked. All the things are fucked. But also like what brilliance of like finding a place where there's no cameras, where you figured that out. Like, there's no surveillance. And like as a kid who used to like steal shit from the grocery store for like poor folks in my neighborhood, I was like, oh, yeah, I learned this from my mom. As wild and ridiculous as she is, I learned that from my mom. So I think there was this really like big like crip access moment and I think that that's something I try to recreate in my work and like at least the piece in this gallery because I think I just really wanted there to be this thing that's like tied to so many labor things like the idea of a crate that I think I found myself using so much in some really fucked up jobs like needing to take breaks and and wanting that to be like particularly like a crip working class of color um like peace like uh recognizing that or being able to even like tactilely feeling that like really wanting that um thing that's ours and so yeah I feel like my work is always like a love letter to like aunties like my mom and people like me who need to take breaks um and then the, I think the other thing is also like Punjabi art is I don't know I think it's like really not mainstream at all and I don't need it to be but I think it's very misconstrued and like complicated and I think that there's a beauty in that but I think the idea that like we always have day beds in all of our places inside or outside and that it's like has no arms on it it has no like weird infrastructure where like fat folks can't just like can actually sit I think that's like so beautiful so I think being able to recreate that in my work was really really lovely and also like testing it with my fat ass and other fat people in my life being like we can sit on this shit and it's not gonna break so I think the, like how do we actually engage with art that's gonna like hold all of us um really really wanting and craving that especially as like public architecture is like so anti-homeless so fat phobic um and like actually doesn't allow you to ever sit or lay down um so I think that was for me the thing all the things <laughs> I will say as a fat person who has the at the larger set, larger end of the fat spectrum, I really had a nice time vamping and testing out all the chairs as like the higher end of who would be in the space. I'm like, oh, perfect, perfect. No, not this one, not this one. <laughs> Logan, do you have anything to share? <laughs> I can share. Sorry, it just took me a minute to find my my mute. Um, I mean, similar to her meet, um, I do feel like, uh, well, I mean, it's the the pieces. It speaks to many things, but I it does speak to like 
um, lineage, right? It, for me, um, but I, I think I, you know, I it does. I think it's work that um, it is tactile. I feel like people can touch it, but I'm all, I'm always cognizant of the fact that like you're like the Western model of an art gallery is like people are always intimidated to touch. Um, but I'm more than happy for people to touch. I think with this particular body of work, um, it feels like the end of a cycle a little bit. Um, one of the things that I know about myself more than just an artist, but as a person, like I gravitate, like I'm a very material, like I like objects. I like, I work very object bound with, within my practice. Um, and I like old things, like give me like antiques like I just want to just swoon over stuff like that and figuring out how things are made and um but I'm the type of person for whatever reason that I'm like the last person to own anything like you I could like get like a hat from like the 1700s that's like been from hand to hand to hand you know like lots of people owning it and like taking very good care of it and even though I'm like very well intentioned for whatever reason I don't know if it's cosmic or whatever I like I have, or like I have a strong handle on things but like I always am the last person to own something like it always just destroys and so I kind of thought like oh that's kind of funny to think about something that's so uh, like finite like bronze and it's also a signifier of co like colonization so like okay well if I'm going to be the last person on this like fucking let it be destroyed right so for me like these pieces are things that are and they're like I always say this wrong word but like debtorous right like bringing bringing things that are no longer of use to others I mean tobacco does have a use but but you'll notice that the tobacco is at the end of its grow cycle. So it's like kind of at the stage where it's going to, it's, it's seeded. Like you're also not supposed to let thing, let that plant go to seed. Um, but for me, I'm like, it's a bit the end of a cycle, but like the potential for new growth, right. And thinking about how we can decompose everything so it can start anew and feel. So yes, people can touch it. There is a tactile element to it. Like, those things will never stay as they are like they'll they'll find new purposes for it or they'll find new homes and and that's totally okay um alex and patch both of your works were very much touched on during the opening in a way that made me happy i feel like because there was more than one touchable thing in this show, it kind of gave people more of uh, permission, even though they already had it to be able to touch things in the space. I find that a lot of touch objects, if there's only one, they're kind of just like mm -hmm, anxiously looked at and mm -hmm, <laughs> but this was not the case. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just um, share a bit about the incorporation of those touch objects in your practice. Yes, I can do that. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've been making textiles for sharing for almost a decade. Oh boy, that's fine. Um, <laughs> and um, I had the privilege of my first show being um, at a disability, like a disabled art space. And so my first experience of having my work curated was like already considering things that I didn't really know about generally because I hadn't been in a gallery space like that but like yeah so like the lowering of things the um um different spaces different lighting things like that and so in that show it was uh there was an offer of like oh if you want to have your work to be tactile and I was like yes because I I've, I've been touching it for like so long and I want to share it with people um and so it was it like adds a for in the quilting specifically and in embroidery, embroidery, it like adds an excitement to make it because I already find like the tactility of it like really delicious, but like adding more things, knowing that like someone will be able to interact with it. And um, I, I am very sensory sensitive and I'm very like sensory aware. And so being able to like, blah, 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 like put in my sensory like energies into these things, um, 
and making soft things that feel inviting, like making things that could be like, you could sleep on it, you could sleep under it. Like, you know, you could wipe your butt with it if you really have to, like emergencies, you know, are in a pandemic. So like, and like that feels good. It feels good that someone can come and touch a thing that they may not have like chance to touch in that way. Like, like, like Logan was saying. Um, and just like as an access for so many, so many reasons of um, needing that access. But um, yeah, I just, I really like touching it and I want to share that with people. Hi, um, this is Alex. Um, I guess, oh, there's so many things that I could talk about for this question. So I guess I want to touch on the talk, touch on the touch object. Um, but I guess I also wanted to, to talk a little bit about the stains, the sweat stains, um, in relation to viewer, the, the audience. And, um, I feel like for me, I'm, I, I enjoy putting maybe not, it's maybe it's not as apparent in this piece, but I enjoy putting, um, kind of like evidence or traces residue of the body, um, kind of in juxtaposition with materials that are maybe more industrial or, or reference like workspaces to kind of visualize that tension. Um, and I really, and with, with this PC, a lot of the, the pillowcases have sweat stains. Um, and I, I, there's something very, uh, satisfying for me and what having a viewer kind of look upon like this extended amount of time and, and bodily bodily many things um but with look upon it like with tenderness and with care and and um not out not with like disgust or abject um and to have that that like the, their gaze be a gaze of care um like upon the sweat stains for me is really really powerful and, and really warms my heart um and with the touch object um I I think more and more in my practice I'm really trying to center touch and that I feel like that's happening in a lot of ways like some some works call for different things I feel like like some works um maybe it's like a 2D work or like a photograph and the touch object is separate um, or something else. Um, but I really, more and more, I really am interested in incorporating the touch object. If, if, the, if the art object itself is not touchable for some reason, then incorporating the touch object within the actual piece. Um, in the past, this work um, had been shown with a touch pillow, but the touch pillow was like only brought out for a touch tour. Um, and I was happy to do that. But then with this show, I was like, okay, um, let's let's have it not be hidden necessarily like behind the office um, or behind a desk. And so I, I kind of I've left, left the decision up to Sarah Ty. And I was so happy when I saw the like the the clear pedestal, the clear short pedestal. I because I didn't I didn't know exactly um like there could have been so many so many ways to incorporate it incorporate it into the installation um so when I saw that I was like that's amazing because for me it was like both a way to indicate that this is the one you can touch um but because it was a clear pedestal and short it was easy it was accessible to grab but also it wasn't just like a white column that like distanced itself from the the actual installation it was they were together um, and I just thought that was really beautiful. And so I'm really, um, right now I'm really inspired to continue making more touch pillows, not necessarily in the same way as pillow fight, but, um, just thinking about like all the potentials of touch pillows and filling them with all kinds of things. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm excited about like what the potentials for touch are and also with pillows thinking about all of our own relationships with our own bed, our own beds as well. I love beds. I'm in my bed right now. I think this easily could have been the bed show. 
and then I had to like ground myself and be like okay enough of your experience there are other things beside the bed but I might say my passion project is the bed um and I really love skiing and interacting when you so kindly allowed me to like arrange the works with the sweat stains and it reminded me a lot of uh film like analog film how you get the the imprint the trace of life onto the film to then be witnessed later on is like this life is living um and I think especially as the show as I said earlier came out of so much isolation and grief like being able to add my own medical supplies into the bag it was even if we're not here together we're all here together in the bag like I, I really got really emotional <laughs> about all of the work but especially being able to contribute in that way and have that just hugely signifying moment um, by myself. I also, as someone who's six feet tall, spent a lot of time rolling around the gallery in an office chair as an, in an effort to remind myself that what I think 48 inches is, is not 48 inches. Um, I think a lot about, speaking of the office chair, how when we have shows like this, when we have any kind of artistic practice that is part of labor and like work proper, um, how the kind of realities get lost in, in favor of like the abstract or in favor of the reality that, re that sits on the wall and not in the space. And I think a lot about how as a curator, I had to have my own access hacks to be able to be in the space and do things. And I'm wondering for all of you, what kind of negotiations, what kind of boundaries you have to set with your practice um, in terms of balancing your own capacity to affirm yourself, your ability to rest, even from these practices that are healing, that are life affirming. I think, I know, especially working with certain materials, like God knows I'm always on the voice notes with Patch and they're always sewing something. And I'm like, oh my God, like I can't. Um, so there's this act also within all of this conceptual work that we're speaking of that is physical endurance, that is mental endurance, that can sometimes be emotional endurance. And I'm wondering um, if your work is an act of care for yourself, how do you care for yourself within that work? I can speak again if, okay. Um, yes. So something happened, something exciting happened with this piece. Um, I get really excited about like certain numbers and so it'll get stuck in my head that I want to make a certain quantity of things. Um, my work has kind of been like growing in size and like complexity as it does as you grow or whatever. Um, but then it like took me a minute to be like, oh, but it's really hard to, to like do a king size quilt or it's like really hard to like make a, like rugs are really heavy. Like it's like a lot. Um, and then I was just like, oh, I can, I can make it, I can make it a size that actually is like doable and like finishable. Um, and so I'm excited that my work is going to be like becoming more intimate too, because like, it'll just kind of be as far as my little, my little arms can go, my little five, two, six feet, five, five, two, two, <laughs> and my little wingspan. Um, and the other thing that has been part of my work before, but um, with quilting, there's so much, like, there's a lot of, like, rules with quilting, even though it can be, like, really freeform and, and improv, um, but, like, with, so with, like, a lot of things, like, sewing things, things that have been around for a long time, but also colonized and, like, commodified, um, straight lines, you know, tight corners, um, even stitches, things like that, not having anything, like, off, um is really important having like the same you know whatever and that's just not there's like there's nothing straight about me <laughs> there's nothing easy about you know like I have no smooth edges and so um I've I mean that's exciting I'm not doing any more binding on any of my quilts and, anymore so um all my quilts are going to be raw edges which just feels like so nice because I like that's it feels like like I'm hiding them away sometimes or I'm like hiding the labor when I when you close it up um and so yeah I'm really excited about that and I'm excited about making small things because that feels more accessible to me and also if like people want to hang out with them it's more accessible to have like a like a two foot thing than like a so yeah that's that's kind of an, a development that's happening
I can talk again. I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I'll just say really quickly, um, working with bronze was something I was super intimidated about because I'm like the little, you know, I feel like an effeminate gay and it's such like a masculine dude energy space. Um, but at a certain point, maybe it's just me aging. I was like, I want to swear, but fuck it. I'm going to do it. And it's, I'm going to, I'm going to like dominate the space in my own way and they can deal with it. And it's been really nice. And actually hearing everyone talk last thing, um, I have a, the workshop next week at, in the space, I'm going to let people, I'm going to, because bronze is so heavy and it's like the weight of colonization. I'm going to let people hold the pieces. If anyone who comes who wants to like hold stuff. I'll, and like antlers are always fun to touch. So just in hearing everyone talking about touch, I'm going to facilitate that. You've been influenced. I'm so glad because I was looking, I've been looking at the antlers and the antlers have been looking at me. Does anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to share about access and hacking their practice to be more accessible to themselves? I can uh, share a little bit. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that because I was kind of trained as a printmaker, which is a incredibly physically demanding laborious process that I happen to really love, but it doesn't love me and my body. Uh, and so I've been really working to find uh, technology as a way of an extension of embodiment. So for this work, I've been working with a laser cutter. So it's a way for me to off put the labor onto machines and allow my body to be in states of rest while that work can occur. So it's been transformative to find this space where I'm kind of cripping printmaking, I'm cripping systems of productivity within our own arts culture by making that space for like act, uh, rest throughout as like an active part of the practice and just finding time to like have a little bit of joy in the practice so that it's not as laborious or painful at the end. And it's actually been the most transformative thing. I used to find it very restrictive to not be able to be a printmaker and as soon as I kind of let go of that grief of what I considered, you know, traditional print, full world opened and this new access tool of technology has just been like magic. Uh, I love being in community with my little PD400 show tech. It's a treat. Um, I could, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Alex. That's okay, you can go first. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I feel like I'm really resonating with Patch said about like wanting things not to be straight and also that not be possible. Um, all the strips that I used to like weave on top of the crates um, were really raw edged and like also just like completely random sizing because I, I just can't do the numerical things um, and also don't have the like hand steadiness to do that. Um, and that felt really good and freeing. And I think also like traditional manjas usually build like a wooden frame. I'm not fucking doing that. Like I don't have the capacity. Like I'm not holding any of that shit. I'm not doing any measuring. And I think the like access hack of like using crates to make the manja was exactly that. I also know that like I don't have the strength to be able to actually weave um, the base in a traditional way, which is like very, very, very laborious. You need to have like multiple people with you who can like have the same dexterity and knowing that like, okay, well, even if my weaving isn't great, there's still like a plastic thing underneath. So nobody's gonna fall through. <laughs> so that's like, great. that's great. Um, and I think the other thing, I like really needed body doubling while making this this time around um, and like had loved ones like sleep over with me while I pulled all nighters because I feel like I was going to spiral otherwise. And I typically do, but I was like, this time I actually can't burn out. Like when I'm trying to do something that's supposed to like give me joy and it's supposed to be grounding. Like, so I think I had to change the strategy up a little bit. Um, and one of those people was Aiden, also a good friend of patches who slept over <laughs> and like, you know, was just there. That was really lovely. Um, and 
I think the reason why I also started to weave is because I'm losing a lot of mobility in my hands and painting and illustrating and like doing things that are very, very like, I need to hold something like this um, just isn't possible. But being able to kind of weave where I don't have to do this all the time is really, really helpful. And it's like, I'm trying to give myself permission to like stumble into the practice. Um, and my grandma used to weave. She was like super traditional weaver. She used to take jute and like, and she was crypt out as hell. I have no idea how she, what her hacking was, but she was able to do the full process. And like, I would like to learn it, but I don't necessarily think I have a desire to do something that laborious. I feel like what I'm doing is enough. <laughs> so also giving myself room to like be okay with that and like not feeling like if I don't know how to do something traditionally or based off of culture, um, it's not actually valid. I think that's like the beauty of being crip as fuck, right? So. <laughs> I feel like that speaks so much to what, what I was going to say. I was going to, um, I've been thinking about uh, just perfection, perfectionism. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot recently too, because um, I notice a lot that I'll, have it in my mind that I want to do something in a certain way and that I like almost do it but I mess up a little bit and I'll just like lose it um <laughs> and then I'll have to it'll take like another disabled friend to be like no that's part of the work that is the work like that's what it's supposed to be and I'm like and it it's it's so wonderful because I feel like that's one of the reasons I love being an artist is because I, I learn from my work. It teaches me. So as I'm talking about um, critiquing standards of productivity, I still have these like things that I'm like unlearning over time in my practice. And um, I feel like, um, yeah, that's how, that's how I've been trying to take care of myself. I think it, within the, within the, my practice which nourishes me there are moments where where I have to take care of myself within that and and for me I've found that being that the answer for me or one of the answers for me has been to to just really let go of perfectionism as much as possible um and to like continuously be be re remembering that and and remind myself that and that like when things happen in different ways um it's 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 like a wonderful thing and it's really nice to see the artist's hand and if I'm trying to cut a piece of memory foam and it's jagged then that's cool and it doesn't have to be a beautiful straight cut or something I just have to jump on that and say thank you so much for saying that I always try to tell my students that perfectionism is unobtainable boring and like ableist as fuck so delighted to hear it expressed so beautifully um and I've also made that approach of space for um the work to speak back to me um and that when these flaws in my work it's it's part of it and to me that's like crip aesthetics fully coming through not leaning into that perfectionism so yeah it's just so delighted and grateful to hear that Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'm very cognizant of time. I'm shame spiraling because of how I've biffed the time management of this event. I don't know. Why would why would I be trusted with that? I don't know. Um, but before we go, I just wanted to make some space if any of you had questions for each other, because I feel like we've been working very siloed, like one on one. And I love a I love a communal moment where we get to have a authorial question making and answer making that comes from beyond the confines of my own brain so I just wanted to offer that if any of you have questions for each other or comments or you know I'm laughing because I just received a message from Scott that says no shame no shame <laughs> I want to ask about treats um, because treats are nice um, and I like giving them to myself and it's our season, <laughs> your season. So, um, so my question is <laughs> um, what, what are like, it's kind of like building on what Sarah asked about like 
caring for yourself in the in the work of it like in the come down when, it, when the work comes back to you um like I have stuff that I just don't unwrap <laughs> I'm like you've done the, great <laughs> good job thank you you're back I trust <laughs> this um and yeah and so like uh do you like unwrap your things do you like have a little party do you have a little like a sweet thing do you have a little salty do you have pizza what do you do what do you do I feel like I'm always one question behind because I think it's I like mishear things and this is part of the struggle of having shitty hearing but um I wanted to just say that like a crip hack for me when I like an extension on that last thing that I had said about going into the bronze studio the reason that I'm typically usually intimidated is because they are dude spaces but they're also spaces that there's lots of rules and I always have a hard time hearing them all and like adhering to them um and so part of my own self-acceptance with not being able to hear all the time has been like fuck it um treat for me is i'm not really allowed to eat chocolate and i always when i do something that gives me a little bit of funding outside of like my livelihood i'm like i'm going and i'm buying a, a bag of those linden things and i'm going to eat the entire bag and i don't care and i don't unwrap things i don't unwrap things until the next time they're needed well those things actually sit in my house so they will be unwrapped but typically i don't unwrap I love the treat I, as a, a derelict rule break. Like, I'm going to give myself the biggest tummy ache. <laughs> I was just going to say, I am also team un, uh, unopening, enjoying things to just come back, extend gratitude, and leave them in their place of rest until... Uh, I have the spoons to do anything else with them. Um, but I often also return to my work. So I find a little bit of distance is nice. And then going back into the pieces and reacquainting ourselves with each other. Uh, and as for treats, I am actively staring down a bag of Lay's potato chips and the most basic French onion dip. And ooh, once this chat is over, I'm going to treat myself. I think my my biggest treat is is bubble tea, um, and I it's funny because I feel like that's something that hurts my stomach the most. But I I I don't know. It's I call it my happy juice. It just makes me happy. It tastes so good. So I'm like, eh, maybe my stomach will behave today. I really want it, and um, yeah. So I'll get bubble tea all the time. Um, in in terms of like, uh like un unwrapping like like unwrapping like work when it comes back um I feel like I have so many there's different ways that I do it like some some works they just live with me like I'm sitting on my bed which is a past piece and will be made into a new piece so um a solution of storage has been just living with the thing um and then but some things I'll just put it away until I can deal with it again but then lately I have been having to do maintenance on old pieces um which um I'm trying to 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 kind of embrace as a as a way to care for the work. Lovely. I will just note that Harmeet is on a phone call, which is perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I think that maybe I will close off our conversation there. Not that I wouldn't like to continue, but one, we've already gone over the time that I mentioned. And two, if I keep talking, even though I want to, things are gonna go bad. Um, and maybe that will happen for some of you as well. So um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like truly from the bottom of my heart for sharing your work and sharing your practices. And also like to be frank, as like a Black disabled curator specifically where like the process, like the behind the scenes of curating has been very harmful. Um, you you lot are like the kindest, warmest folks. Like after every interaction, I'm like, like me, me, me. um and like as a hater especially that's very notable 
Um, so yeah, I just, not to be so West Coast, but thank you very much for like your energy and the warmth that you bring alongside, of course, your practice and your labor and your efforts. I know that kind of the irony of the labor that goes into a show like this is that a lot of us aren't able to show up within the confines that are placed on us. So um, yeah, I just want to thank all of you and thank you for taking the time tonight to, to, to speak with everyone. Um, I'm not sure if Rebecca will hop back on. I'm not sure if any of you want to say anything. Um, the vibe for tonight, if you can't tell already, is like question mark, sure. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to like really thank you. And side note, my therapist told me that if I wanted to see the things I wanted to see in a space that I would have to try to build them collectively. And it turns out they were right because they're always right. Um, so here we are. <laughs> Thanks so much for all your work, Sarah Ty. I don't think the masking or the seating would have happened without you. And that's going to be like something that I carry in my own practice. So this has just been absolutely lovely. And yeah, thanks to everybody for coming out here and sharing and being so vulnerable. Um, it's been a real pleasure to learn more about your work. Um, but yeah, I think we can wrap it up yeah, unless you all want to take like a cute group shot, screenshot photo. But uh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely okay everybody look like you're having fun yeah. <laughs> i will photoshop harmy in and by photoshop, yeah. <laughs> i mean whatever i can do okay <gasps> yes okay one two three smile